Hi, I'm Pastor Goodman. And this is the Lord who God's life. Okay, so I understand that the rite of holy baptism doesn't actually look all that impressive, and I also understand that the life of the baptized person doesn't always look all that impressive. They do have a mirror. I am a poor, miserable sinner. So I understand the temptation to ask, you know, how do you know this thing worked? Like, I don't think it's bad to ask that question. I don't think it's wrong to question whether or not this, this rite of baptism, the washing of water with God's word, actually does all the stuff that it says it does. I mean, honestly, if you're willing to stake your soul on this, it really ought to be sturdy enough to question if baptism doth now save you, like First Peter says, really is true, you should be able to verify it. The thing is, there's really only two places where you can try and test out whether or not baptism works. You can either look to the giver or the receiver. You can either look to God's word or to us. And the problem is we almost always would rather measure ourselves than God when it comes to baptism. And that sort of leaves us with this ugly situation where we have to try and comb through a baptized life to find out whether or not there's sin afterwards. And in doing so, we miss the whole point of baptism because we end up looking for sin as a sign that baptism didn't work when baptism was given for the forgiveness of sins. I mean, if there are no sins, why baptize in the first place? If this is not a sinner, why would we need to baptize him at all? I mean, this is what John the Baptist would take to Jesus who hath no sin. You should probably be baptizing me, guy. You should be able to test this stuff. But we don't test whether or not baptism works in the water. And we also don't test whether or not baptism works in the life of the baptized. In a large catechism, Luther writes, But these people, the fanatics, are so blinded that they do not see the word and command of God and regard baptism and the magistrates only as they regard water in the brook or pots or as any other man. And because they do not see faith or obedience... They conclude that they are to be regarded as invalid. Here looks a concealed, seditious devil who would like to tear the crown from the head of authority and trample it underfoot, and in addition, pervert and bring to naught all the works and ordinances of God. See, when it comes to baptism, we do test whether or not it works, but we don't do it in ourselves any more than we would do it in the water in the pot. We test this thing based on the word and command of God. Did God command baptism? Did he attach a promise to baptism? Good. Now, test it, not based on the water and not based on us, but based on he who would dare to attach his own name to these promises. For after all, you are not baptized in your own name. You are not baptized in the name of water, but you are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For it is God Almighty who wishes to give you gifts through this baptism. Baptism is for sinners from the Holy God who would give it to you to forgive your sin, to save you from yourself, to save you from your sin. Baptism does not stand on you. It cannot stand on you. It stands on Jesus. So test it in him. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Did he promise you that baptism unites you to that very same resurrection? For doesn't Romans say, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. See, to measure obedience as a sign of faith is to put all of the certainty on you. To measure whether or not a baptism worked by how well you're behaving. It is to put the whole entire thing on your own back. And there, it is the devil at work to do something really, really tricky. He would trample God's promises by making you the one who has to fulfill them. He would rip away the crown from God Almighty who has authority and try and make you wear it. And look how funny you look in it. And then point to you in the mirror and say, look, look at that sin right there. How could you possibly have a baptism that works? if this is how you behave. And here, the, the devil would trick us into to trying to measure baptism based on ourselves and instead of whether or not Jesus is risen. Instead, keep the whole thing on Christ who would wear that crown of thorns for you and for me, who has conquered death, who has risen from the dead. There we have something certain. For Paul himself says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. So here's a simple little question when it comes to sin. 
I can call it wrong. I can call it bad. I certainly should repent of it. But I can ask one little question. Did my sin, as awful as it was, put Jesus back in the tomb? If it did, baptism is invalid. Baptism is no good. Baptism does not save, as the scriptures say. But if my sin, however awful, can't quite manage to uncrucify my Lord, can't quite manage to put him back in that tomb, then the baptism which he has given me for the forgiveness of that sin still stands to pull me out of my own tomb. That baptism which you have been given, that still stands to pull you out of your own tomb, that still stands to daily and richly forgive you your sins and grant to you a comfort that your own works could not possibly deliver so that you might actually have the peace that God would have you ha receive in, in baptism. Test baptism, but test it in the one who would give it and attach his name to it, not yourself, because there's no certainty in you, but there's all kinds of certainty in him who rose from the dead, even Jesus Christ our Lord.